I posted the poll to my YouTube community tab a while back, asking people what my next game review should be. I gave them 5 choices, all of which I've never played before. Vigil Andy 8 came in first, which is why I'm reviewing it right now. I'll be doing this again sometime, so keep your eyes out for the next poll. When I first started researching Vigilante 8, I figured out why it was first place in the poll. This game has a cult following. The reason why wasn't apparent when I first started playing it, but eventually I would figure it out. What you're seeing is basically the entire game. You have to destroy all the other cars before your own life meter gets to zero. There are eight characters to choose from, each with their own personalized vehicle. Each one also has its own special weapon some of which are very bizarre, like a heat-seeking tire that explodes on impact, or a swarm of bees. I'll mention the bees again in a minute here. Additionally, there's a bunch of weapons laying around that you can pick up, like heat-seeking missiles and bombs that arch upward and fall down. There are five different ones, but you can only hold three at a time. If you pick up a fourth one, it drops one of the others. So there's some strategy involved, you can't just go around picking everything up in sight. You have to think about what weapons you want and what weapons you don't want. Also laying around are temporary power-ups, including one that doubles the destructive power of your weapons. That one is a must. Each player also has a weak machine gun built into their vehicle, with unlimited ammo. There are 11 different maps to play on. These maps are rather big and feature lots of destructible things. It's hard to find anything that isn't destructible. My favorite map is the Ski Lodge. I love it when I see snow on the N64. There's something beautiful about it. That map also has a ski lift that you can drive into and go up and down the slope. That's the thing about these maps. Not only are they destructible, they have lots of interactive elements. There's little details that you discover each time you play it. The game takes place in an alternate 1970s timeline. A faction called the Coyotes is trying to take control of the western US oil industry. A band of good guys, the Vigilantes, is trying to stop them. Despite all my research, I've never been able to figure out why it's called Vigilante 8. I'm almost certain it's because there are 8 characters to choose from at the beginning. But that doesn't fully make sense, since half of those characters are vigilantes and the other half are coyotes. Even after additional characters are unlocked, there's no number of things that adds up to 8. If you know where the name comes from, or have a theory, leave a comment. The game was developed by a very small team of people, and is a spiritual sequel to the popular PC game Interstate 76. I haven't played that one, but the connection between the two games must be strong, because in the credit sequence, there's a whole section that lists the people who made Interstate 76. There are many modes in the game, but the one most people will play is the quest mode. You choose a character and play through a small storyline encompassing about four missions. There's cutscenes in between the missions that explain the character's motivation for joining the battle. As you play through each character's story, you start to unlock other characters, and even a few maps. That's quite the motivation to play through this mode, so I sat down and played through every single character and unlocked everything. It's during that playthrough that I figured out why this game resonates with people. It's whimsical. From the outside, it seems like a serious game involving factions trying to kill each other with vehicles, but there's actually a lot of humor in it. And once you see the individual storylines, you realize how silly the game is. There's one guy who's pissed off about his beehives getting hit with radiation, and another guy who's obsessed with finding UFOs. In fact, one of the last unlocks is a UFO. Some of the endings to these characters are hilarious. Some of them end up accidentally killing themselves in very humorous ways. It's not just the storyline that makes the game whimsical. It also comes from some of the voices you hear on the character select screen and the voices you hear during battle. Gonna sting you real good. I may be half human, but I'm all woman. The bottom line is, this game is meant to be fun and should not be taken too seriously. 
there's other modes in the game as well. Arcade is just where you pick a map and pick a number of opponents and duke it out in one large battle. Survival mode is about the same, except the enemies keep coming until you eventually die. There's multiplayer modes as well, but I didn't have a chance to play them. The gameplay might look mindless, but there's more than meets the eye. There's a lot of little intricacies. Your engine sometimes stalls and it's really hard to get it running again. If you have a big vehicle, you can ram into the other cars, but you don't want to try that in a small vehicle. If you hit an opponent with two weapons at once, it's called a whammy, and it does an extra amount of damage. There's also 10 special moves that can be executed with certain weapons selected. For example, hitting down 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 causes you to fire a green blast, which causes your enemy to flip over. I never did any of these special moves. And there's a simple reason why, and that's where we get into one of the big flaws in the game. I am able to drive right up to an enemy and just mash buttons until they are dead. With this quote strategy, I tore through the quest mode, and I died a very few amount of times. In this mission, I destroyed everyone in about one minute. Granted, I was playing on the game's default difficulty, unleaded, but something tells me that this strategy would still work on the other settings. The game's AI just isn't up to the task. The only other car combat game I've played through is Twisted Metal Black, and I don't remember this kind of stuff happening in that game. Of course, it was on the PS2, so the programmers had better hardware to build the AI with. The game's physics are very unusual and take a lot of getting used to. Sometimes the cars spin and ricochet in very unusual ways. And sometimes you just go right through solid objects. At first I hated these kind of interactions, but I warmed up to it and after a while I just accepted it as part of the game's whimsical nature. That leads me up to the funniest moment I experienced. Right here I'm going to use the earthquake weapon on my opponent. It's basically a distortion that you create on the ground that goes in a circle around your vehicle up to a limited point. If any opponents get hit by that distortion, they are sent flying off to the side. I'll stop talking and let you see what happens. So what happened is the opponent got hit by the earthquake, which sent them off to the right. For some reason they bounced off the sewer drain and went flying to the other end of the map. I love that this happened, but I know in a modern game, they would have patched that out, which is kind of sad when you think about it. While we're on the subject of special weapons, let's talk about the bees. The character Beeswax sends a swarm of them after you as his special weapon. And if you hear them coming, you better floor it and pray you don't run into anything and come to a dead stop. If the bees get you, they will bounce you around like a trampoline for what seems like forever. During this bouncing time, you're also being hit by other weapons sometimes. This bee weapon kind of breaks the game, and whenever I see beeswax, I make sure I kill him first and fast. It wouldn't be a review without any mention of the graphics. Given the system that the game is on, and for being released in 1999, I have no complaints. As expected for games of that time, there's a degree of pop-up and a lot of darkness. But it's not as dark as Twisted Metal Black. That game might as well take place on Pluto. The maps look great in Vigilante 8. I already mentioned the great detail. The Vegas area is gorgeous and has gas stations, casinos, wedding chapels, and even a little bit of lens flare. There's a first person view in the game, which makes it feel more immersive, but I couldn't keep it like that for long. It made me a little nauseous. The game utilizes the N64 expansion pack, though it isn't required. For those who don't know, that's a little memory pack released by Nintendo that doubles the amount of RAM. In other words, it gives certain games better graphics. All the footage you've seen so far is with the expansion pack in. When I removed it and played for a little bit, I saw no difference. But when you do have it in and pause the game, you can switch to a 480x360 high res mode. 
I played that for a while and I didn't see much difference. In fact, I think it's a little bit choppy. But all hopes of a graphical enhancement are not lost. They hid in the game another high resolution mode. This time it's 640x480. And it's only enabled if you put in the password max resolution. Playing with that on, I do see an improvement. I didn't get to test it for too long, as I was already done with the game at that time. In hindsight, I should have played through the whole game with that feature enabled, assuming it keeps it enabled when you save the game. That's another thing I should mention. You can save your progress on a memory card or with a password. There's a lot of hidden passwords that you can look up on the internet, ones that make the tires bigger or alter the gravity. The game's first release was on the PS1, and the consensus is, is that the N64 version had better graphics, and the PS1 has a better soundtrack. The N64 one does have an additional map. You have to beat the quest mode with every character to unlock it. It's called Dreamland 64, and it's unlike anything else you see in the game. It's almost like you're driving around inside a different video game. There was also a release of Vigilante 8 on the Game Boy Color, which is a totally different game, obviously. In 2008, the game got remade from the ground up and released on the Xbox 360 as Vigilante 8 Arcade. I haven't played it, but from the footage I've watched on YouTube, it's a huge graphical upgrade, though it seems a little bit slow. There is a sequel called Vigilante 8 Second Offense, and it was released on the PS1, the N64, and Dreamcast. I played the Dreamcast version for a few minutes, and all that I can say is that it feels like a totally different game. It might be because I picked the garbage truck. Another game that uses the same engine and has many similarities is Star Wars Demolition. So if you're a fan of Vigilante 8, you might want to play that one too. In the end, I had a good time playing this game, and I want to thank my viewers for having me review it. I think I'd only recommend it to fans of car combat games, a genre that doesn't get much attention nowadays. People who grew up playing this game are probably going to enjoy it as well. I recommend you increase the difficulty and use the max resolution password if you have the expansion pack. So that's all I had today. Hope you enjoyed the review. I'll see you next time.